Innovation Program. Um, a couple of logistics. If you are here for the anonymous film, that film is actually a 282 that was misprinted. So if we're having a dynamic lecture, you're welcome to stay. Uh, my journey with Phil and Vienna White took place in 1995. I moved uh, to Buffalo, New York from San Francisco as a visiting professor of art education and worked at Buffalo State College and the Birdsville Penny Art Center. And my first professional development session was in New York City at a round table with other museum educators. And this dynamic, brilliant man, Philip, talked to us about this strategy that really has changed my teaching practice at the university level, but primarily in museum education. And when I came to this museum in 1997, it became the catalyst for our DOSA program. We restructured our DOSA program from a very traditional lecture-based approach where we looked at our visitors as these sponges and these empty vessels, and we adopted what we call visual thinking strategies. So I'm just honored that we've had Philip for the past two days on behalf of my executive director, Jill Hart, so we are just pleased that you're here. Um, so Philip has a long history, I won't go into all of his accolades, but he is the founding co-director of Visual Understanding Through Education, which is the nonprofit organization that has created visual thinking strategies. Philip served as the director of education at the Museum of Modern Art from 1983 to 93. He was also the director of education at the Metropolitan Museum of Art was the founding director of the Aspen Art Center. He received the National Art Education Educator of the Year Award in 1993 and serves on the board of Art Matters. He has um, many publications, including six children's books on visual arts, and one that is actually outside will be doing a book signing focusing on how the arts can be put through learning. So please stay afterwards and discuss and have Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you really did a nice job on the weather. <laughs> and since I, at this point, live on Cape Cod, which um, wasn't as bad as it got <laughs> in some parts of the country, sort of, it's still, we had a very, very long winter, and it's very nice to sort of, ah, you know, sort of feel, feel a little bit too warm for a moment or two. In any case, um, I, um, I, I actually got an elevation there at the moment. I was director of, of, of high school programs at the Metropolitan Museum at sort of at the beginning, at kind of at the beginning of museum education, sort of at the end of the 60s, when museum education as we know it was, was basically invented. But prior to that time, there were, there were very relatively few programs in, in museum education. Um, it was basically lectures by uh, art historians to interested public and at scheduled moments and occasionally there would be groups that would make appointments and um, over the course of the 60s sort of more and more of that sort of thing started to happen kind of thing. There were art schools in lots of museums but they were for the training of artists. There were sometimes programs for younger people but for the most part to the, the way we think of museum education today is having, as having labels and brochures and audiovisual devices and programs for special audiences and outreach. It's okay? <laughs> um, it was all sort of, it all kind of, um, with the various different sort of experiments began during the, the late 60s and early 70s. And so what we know of as museum education began then. Um, and so I kind of came in at a moment when there was no training um, and it was, there was an opportunity, therefore, to sort of invent. And we, um, we did. We did an awful lot of different sorts of things. Um, I became, um, you know, kind of fell into it, I must say. Um, I wasn't born into a, you know, family that sort of spent all its time in museums or concert halls or anything of the sort, really. Um, so I was learning as I... <clears throat> as I went along kind of thing and sort of finding my way. But, um, but because I hadn't been brought up in them in a way, I didn't have too many preconceptions of what was supposed to happen in museums. And that wasn't a bad thing if you were trying to work with new audiences. And any kind of outreach to high schools at that point was new. Um, they were, there were teacher-made appointments. And in fact, I told the class yesterday sort of that one of my foundational sort of 
um, moments occurred during one of these teacher-made appointments from a suburban high school. The students had been taught Greek myth, and the teacher asked me to, in fact, find examples from the Metropolitan's rich Greek and Roman collections to, the, to illustrate these myths so that they could sort of see, see these myths. And I was sort of too new and ignorant, really, um, to know that it was going to be pretty hard to find examples of myth in, among the various different sort of pieces and bits that the museum had, um, but was able to find um, the, some representation of myths in various different uh, pots, Greek pots, all of which were kept in very dusty cases, kind of things, in galleries that had not, were not slick and beautiful like they are today. And um, so I um, prepared this talk for these high school students who came in dutifully followed, uh, following their teacher, like ducks, and um, we squeezed in behind the cases kind of thing, and I said, so, here's, um, <clears throat> this is an illustration of one of the myths that you've been studying. What do you think, what myth do you, myth do you think this is? Um, do you recognize any of the characters that you sort of see here? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, sort of what, kind, what situation, what would be, what, 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 what's, the, what's the action that's taking place here? Do you, any ideas? Nothing, not, not a word. So um, it might have been something that had happened on the bus on the way into, who knows, this was the 60s. But that said, um, that said, um, there wasn't a response. And I said, said to the teacher as we were moving on to the next pot, uh, uh, did I get something wrong? And she said, no, no, no. I taught them Greek myth. They just didn't learn it. <laughs> and the thing that's sort of interesting about that is that that happens throughout schooling an awful lot of the time. That teachers spend a lot of time teaching, and less is retained than we would like. And now this is a problem. <laughs> it's a problem because it's a waste of time. It's a problem because sort of students aren't being uh, uh, brought into this, you know, the complicated world that the adults have created for them in ways that prepare them truly to sort of take it on in, in its most creative ways. Um, and we, I think we kind of see that by looking around. We're floundering for sort of how to handle problems that perhaps could be floundered, not handled if we were, in fact, a little bit more capable of dealing with um, the complexity, the ambiguity, the lack of sureness, the, um, the, the capacity to work together better, uh, the capacity to sort of take in science and evaluate it in a realistic way and um, criticize it, but, um, but really sort of see what it can tell us instead of rejecting a whole bodies of science that most scientists sort of think is, I think you know what I'm talking about, something to do with the climate, for example. But in any case, um, I blame our education system to some degree on the world that we have made. Um, but, it's, it's, um, but it's about this business of teaching and not learning. Now, what I came to realize when I was working at the Metropolitan, and most of my friends were artists, and I was trying to be a dancer in my spare time, and sort of going to classes and things like that, was that the arts could kind of take over your life in a way that few things can, sort of, I mean, sports can, there are things, many things that can, but the fact is that sort of, um, you know, it, it was, the arts could, um, just began to mean such a tremendous amount to me. And I realized that it was sort of, it wasn't, even, wasn't it was in a plane that had nothing to do with rational stuff, it had to do with the bigger picture of things. It's sort of, so I began to think about sort of, hmm, what are the arts for? And <clears throat> I wasn't sure. <laughs> Um, you could look around in the museums and sort of see that they'd served lots of purposes, and then shortly we're going to take a little tour, a quirky little tour of, of a lot of art to sort of see what different kinds of roles art has played in, in different cultures. But the fact is that sort of um, what does it do for us now became a central question for me. But the reason for asking the question and for trying to probe and find answers and in fact bring it into focus in more people's lives was the fact that I knew inherently that something important, there was something important that was learned through the arts that's hard to learn any other way. And one of the things that occurred to me was that the arts have had an amazing and symbiotic relationship with what we call religion and have had that bond from as long as anybody has any knowledge of human behavior kind of thing that somehow objects have been made to connect people to their gods, to each other, to their understandings of life, um, 
They've been tools, and it's not just visual art, of course, it's not just objects, it's usually things in combinations, so that a lot of the things that we put in an art museum would have been once used in ceremonies or in churches or in um, different other, different other kinds of settings. Yes, there's been a role for art as decorative for a very long time, but we really know, we really fathom that the things that have come down to us and have come down to us in part because somebody believed they were special. They buried them in such ways that they could be eventually found, but they were preserved and saved because of their specialness. And so that, that sense of a deep and key place in culture um, was, is, is something that um, I think we should remember. Um, but this is what you might call a rather quirky little um, collection of things that um, represent sort of different things. But sort of on the upper left, here, here we have a figure that's sort of, um, uh, you know, it's from Minoa. It's Minoan, which we call it a cycladic or cycladic figure kind of thing. And nobody really knows what it's for, sort of because of its shape. Um, with the sort of larger hips, with the breasts and so on. It's sort of thought to be a female figure. And it's thought probably to have something to do with fertility. But exactly what, why, how, how it was used, um, we, don't, we don't know. And one of our reasons for sort of thinking it's so special, I think, is because it's so beautiful and because it sort of corresponds to a lot of the simpl simplifications and things like that that have become typical of, of art of our time, sort of the way it, it eliminates a lot of detail and becomes this, this just almost essential sort of thing. Um, but we don't know what it was for. We just guess that it had something to do with worshiping the capacity of females to produce life. Um, in sort of with things like this that, was, that were dug up from tombs, um, what we know about them is, is not that they necessarily served a wide public, a large, um, did a large service for a wide public, but they were definitely essential for sending on the royalty, thought to be gods, pharaohs, to their afterlife. And a great deal of time and effort was made to create not only tombs, like the pyramids, but also these objects that were sort of stashed with them um, as in, in their, alongside their bodies um, to, be, to accompany them into the afterlife. So, sort of, so the power that was in this kind of thing, which some, somehow told a story uh, in the pharaoh's life, um, to usher them into the afterlife was, is, is something that scholars know about, um, but is something that in a way is lost to another culture. It's not exactly how we believe now. Um, the closer to sort of the kinds of things that sort of do go on in our culture are this thing, this painting which comes from um, the 16th century, um, but it tells two of the um, it's also a storytelling device, but it tells sort of two stories sort of essential to the Christian faith. Sort of one of them, this, the creation story, sort of told symbolically here with God and so on and so forth, doing this, that, and the other thing, and of course the seven days and blah, blah. And then something about the, um, the naughtiness of, of Adam and Eve and their eventual expulsion from the garden as a result of that kind of thing, told in one thing that sort of was, was created for... Um, I'm not sure, exactly sure what the original setting for this was, but it was created for a world in which the majority of people were illiterate, um, but it was required that they know the stories uh, of their faith, and they were often told in liturgy, in scripture, in architecture, in the sculpture in architecture, in windows, in churches, in paintings, and so on, sort of, and so they were conveyed, the messages that were, people were, needed to know were conveyed to them in many different, by many different means, but, um, but, but a great deal of effort and time and, and, and uh, emphasis was placed on them. So we have this sort of thing, which um, has come down to us as sort of as a museum object at this point, but which had a bit, much bigger role in life at another time. And this is the kind of thing that sort of, I'm not sure when this was made, frankly, I, it's on my thing, but, um, but the fact is that sort of typic, this kind of thing has been made for hundreds of years. Uh, it's Buddhist, this is, happens to be Thai, and it is a, in a way a tool for helping people um, get outside themselves and into another set of understandings different from the, these, um, but also about a spiritual path, also about something that sort of takes you into um, 
truths that are not the everyday ones, not the sort of things that, 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 that um, they're the things that get you through the night rather than through the day, if you know what I mean. So, but, <clears throat> And to can carry on with this sort of quirky, um, this is um, a bowl. And an awful lot of, throughout history, humans have created amazing things, um, often much more decorative than this kind of thing. But the, but the uh, impetus to create things that are beautiful and useful also um, is something that's age old and, and goes back as far as anybody has any idea kind of thing. Um, this is a, a bowl that was, that was created for a number of different sort of purposes, but one of them is to hold tea, but also as an object of contemplation um, in, in kind of the same way that the Buddhist um, statue was, um, but slightly different uh, p people might use it, sort of people with a, a more refined sense of, of, their, of an object's place uh, but this, this, even its imperfections and unevenness here sort of is, increases the value of this to the person who can sit for hours and look at this and, and receive aesthetic pleasure from it. So intense aesthetic pleasure is something that, that certain kinds of objects have had in addition to whatever kind of meaning they might have had, also contemplative that it had a more directly religious or spiritual kind of purpose. But um, moving down from there kind of thing, we have um, an old age, you know, I think this is sort of interesting. I forgot to check, but I don't think Rembrandt, I think Rembrandt was a few years younger than me when he painted this. But he's, he does look like he's been through the mill. And I hope I don't. <laughs> anyway, um, but the fact is that sort of, when something like this has created, another kind of attitude toward art making has occurred, sort of something that has more to do with, with uh, human life, existence, sort of, m there may be a way of sort of seeing into the spiritual from this, but this is, this is a, an earthly person who is, uh, you know, through his expression, conveying something very complicated about sort of what, what happens as you age kind of thing, sort of, you know, you can sort of see to some extent the sort of, it's, I could even say almost the ravages of time in the sense of what it's done to, to sort of how he looks. He's, he's tired, but those eyes have a combination of resignation and sadness and maybe deep knowledge. Um, but it's anyway, when one looks at this and sort of the combination of light over here and dark over here and how this all sort of disappears and the tools of his trade are there, but you know, they're kind of left un they're not so easy to focus on as they might have been and, and were in earlier self-portraits of him in, his, in a more vigorous point. So he's sort of given us something here for us to think about, but not necessarily in the same way we might when we were looking at this bowl, but something that might be more profoundly human, more about the human experience and sort of what it does to us over time. So there's, there's the art that can help us maybe understand ourselves in a much more, um, not necessarily in relationship to our gods or our leaders, our kings, but in terms of ourselves and our own aging process. Sort of, we have art that tells stories that come from myth, from the Bible, or from history. And this painting by Goya um, is of a historical moment, but it's way more than just a document of that, that moment because of, of how it in, in depicts uh, the capacity of humans to destroy others, <laughs> other human beings, at close range. Um, and despite the fact that sort of it causes great anguish and might be even a, um, juxtaposed to um, pleading for one's life, um, we can go ahead and pull the trigger. And um, that kind of capacity, I, I, you know, sort of, um, uh, Goya called the series of, this, of which this is one, I think not exactly, but it's in the same vein, the horrors of war. But this, this kind of thing, just, you know, last Friday, a, a young man stabbed his classmate in cold blood, one has to think, sort of in, in a high school kind of thing. And that, that capacity we have for using weapons to sort of um, 
destroy one another kind of thing. Sort of, it's, it's in some part the subject of this painting. And so this art can be there to sort of help us um, understand what we can do in both better senses and less good senses. And what can happen to us regardless of, <laughs> no, there's no firing squad. But their time itself and the sadness, sad things that can happen in a lifetime can bring you to the point where you're sitting there thinking, hmm. And then something completely different. Sort of mid 20th century, we have artists who are responding to a, a notion of everybody's learned to do all kinds of things so extraordinarily well. Let's find a new way to paint. Um, you know, everybody needs to have their own special mark, their own special celebrity, their own identity kind of thing. Am I doing that? I don't know. Um, uh, and so sort of artists of the 20th century sort of working very hard to kind of to create their own uh, signature styles. Um, but sort of as Pollock made this kind of thing, inventing a whole new way of painting that was in profoundly influential, at least on a, on a bunch of painters who continue to dominate the rest of the 20th century sort of thing, he also gives us something to sort of think about in a completely different way. Because of its abstraction, we're not told something like this, but coming shortly after World War II, where we had just dropped atomic bombs obliterating whole cities and things like that, the capacity for um, destruction had become, you know, in a way, almost unthinkable, too enormous for literal depiction. And so perhaps in this kind of thing, <clears throat> when it's dealing with, let's say, not only the kind of anxiety that might have been dominating at the end of World War II as the Soviet Union and the Cold War sort of began to sort of scare us a great deal kind of thing, but also the sort of the notion of what the world, what could happen in the world that was catastrophic. Um, this, this painting came after surrealism, which had been probing the subconscious. And this um, isn't so much that you're doing that, that in the way that dreams do, but in the way that sort of automatic behavior, sort of, um, he, he, uh, uh, Pollock wasn't just heaving paint. He knew exactly what he was doing. He had kind of this, the gesture of an athlete rather than the daubing of a brush kind of thing to sort of guide his his hand, but the, nevertheless, there, was, there were tons of accidents that occurred to the, in this kind of thing, and it couldn't happen without a, some degree of you know, the paint taking on its own life and job um, as he was painting. So sort of it could be a way of sort of reaching into a subconscious at a certain level that was very important, again, sort of in mid-century, um, the mid-century world, really, but certainly in, in New York and in America kind of thing. So, okay, so quirky, as I said, um, incomplete. Um, but nevertheless, I would say that art has had a lot of functions at different times. But what about now? What's it doing for us now? You know, we kind of keep it sequestered in boxes. You know, they're either gallery boxes where you have to feel like you have an awful lot of money and a mission to go in and sort of buy things, or they might be in museums where at one point, when I was at the Museum of Modern Art, we had an event for um, the uh, staffs of a lot of our corporate members. They, they were all in these very fancy glass buildings on Sixth Avenue. And they all, everybody who worked in these, these buildings looked pretty fine, pretty fancy. I mean, sort of, yes, they wore sneakers until they got into their office, and then they changed into their heels. But still, um, we invited, and nobody came. And when we did a survey in these glorious offices, as to why they didn't, they didn't know what to wear. <laughs> they didn't know what to wear to come two blocks to the museum. Meanwhile, I was often wearing Levi's to work there. You know, it's like that's, we build the most wonderful buildings we can kind of thing as museums, but they quite often become the kind of place that an awful lot of people don't feel invited to come. Um, we <clears throat> put things in them in the, in the most beautiful way we possibly can, but we might also be making it so that certain people feel as if they need an invitation of some sort, they need knowledge, they need information that they don't have in order to appreciate them. So we have, we have done something, I mean, sort of museums can be accused of elitism, but by the way, so could concert halls, so could performance centers of all kinds, so could theaters. Um, one of the few kind of democratic 
sort of media that we have that, that's where a lot of what happens in approaches art is our movies. <laughs> but you know, there's the high art movies, and then there are the popular movies kind of things. And you know, some, we think of them that way to some degree kind of thing. And so we don't tell our, any, all of our snitty friends when we go to see an action movie, now do we? I mean, you know what I mean. Sort of, but anyway, um, we've managed to sort of set culture aside in a way that seems very, very unhistorically, ahistorical. And I think it's kind of too bad. Not kind of too bad. I think it's just terrible because I honestly believe that we need art in our lives to be the arts, not just visual art, to be truly human and humane. It's sort of like sleep and love. If we do not have the arts in our lives, something major is missing. And, <clears throat> and I think because of the economic issues in our country, which we're not solving, and which are only probably getting worse, we make it even more difficult for a, a vast majority of people to feel that they have the birthright to the kind of things that would have been theirs throughout history, without question, and are now sequestered for a, a, an empowered group. Um, <clears throat> so, what to do about it? I'm going to show you something that a couple of us worked on in order to sort of to try to change that, to sort of um, to create a way in which um, art could uh, re-engage us in a way that um, <clears throat> I think has, is in the right direction. Um, and it's about looking about it, looking at it, and thinking about it. And it has a name. It's called Visual Thinking Strategies. It's a teaching technique. But I want, and we're going to do it right now, so you're, you're going to have a chance to sort of see me um, demonstrate a teaching method. And also, I want, while you do, participate in this conversation. So take a look at this image, which happens to belong to the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art, by the way. And tell me what you think is going on in this picture. And there's somebody in the practically front row who might have an idea. <laughs> well, maybe not at the moment, but if you have an idea, just tell me. OK, so what's going on here? Yes. So you're seeing a woman who you think is eating an ice cream cone. What did you see that made you say she was eating an ice cream cone? Well, she's holding it, you know, coming out. Actually, it looks like she's trying to sleep on that. Okay, good. So that the the. Female figure here, extended tongue, reaching out toward what seems to be a drip. So he's thinking, this one's after eating an ice cream cone. Good. What more can you find? Yes. Okay, so this, sort of you're seeing something slightly nervous making about this, sort of the, the angle of the cone looks like it could collapse, these scoops could fall off, and, um, and it's emphasized by the fact that sort of she seems to be hunching toward it, and this hand might be there to sort of catch it should it start to, tu start to tumble. Okay, good, what more can we find? Yep. All right, good. So, so several things sort of indicate, kind of support that notion that the, the ice, ice cream might be about to fall because the, <clears throat> there seems to be some wind, her hair is blowing in it, her, her um, kimono or whatever it is, her outfit sort of seems to be, maybe even slipping off of her shoulder kind of thing. So <clears throat> the 
Cone's not the only thing in motion. Okay, good. What more can you find? Yes. So um, you're wondering if they're in fact you're kind of almost making a story that sort of that's, that's something that's, that that the whole there's a lot in motion and that she may in fact have sort of stumbled um, and one piece of evidence is the fact that this seems to be a napkin that sort of maybe has blown or been dropped in in this but you're looking at her eyes and thinking they have a feeling of some kind of worry in them good what did you see in the eyes that made you say that. <laughs> All right, good. So those eyes are so widely open and sort of focused so intently on that cone, it's like, uh, uh, it's like there's just, yeah, feet don't fail me now. Yeah. Okay, good. What more can you find? Yes. is in two different sort of directions. One of them is the fact that sort of this sliding off is not just motion, but in fact might even have sexual implications sort of too. But then you're looking around, you sort of see a very carefully crafted picture with lots of elements that are sort of, you know, very traditional seeming. Um, and, um, and yet the subject matter seems kind of trite and of this moment. So you're thinking there's a kind of a um, juxtaposition there that sort of doesn't quite make sense or is somewhat jarring or something. Okay, good. So maybe there's a point of juxtaposing tradition and now in a very rather banal moment at now. Okay, good. And possibly a little bit sexy. Okay, good. What more can we find? So, so, so the different sort of the disparate nature of, of pieces as you look at it, like the traditional costume, but worn in a, um, a you know kind of a casual way, that's sort of almost sexual kind of thing. Um, the sort of the notion of of the woman enshrouded in, in something like this, but sort of giving a glimpse of her under armpit hair, which um, you know you, you wouldn't expect to see, and you wouldn't also expect to be there, kind of thing, in a more traditional definition of femininity, kind of thing. You're looking at sort of her hands and thinking that, that the way she's holding this is 
not exactly natural, that this also is kind of an extraordinary sort of thing. So you're wondering how many different kinds of things are maybe being um, critiqued or represented, but, but, but you're wondering, kind of building on that idea you, that you brought up of sort of notion of what is this telling us about possibly the, uh, a, a, a Japanese woman in today's culture kind of thing, and a, but it's a redefinition, maybe based to some degree on old, but it's different. Okay, good. What more can we find there? It's hello, and then over there. Uh, when I was looking at this, I was looking at it in terms of Japanese women um, and how um, she, um, in terms of, that she kind of represented a different, um, in terms of what, uh, that's when I think of Japanese women, um, maybe a more European version of a Japanese woman versus kind of the traditional, and then holding Okay, good. So one of the ideas we started with was the fact that she sort of she seems to be licking this cone, but you're sort of changing and, and or maybe even sort of rescuing it from falling. But you're sort of talking about she's going after it, kind of thing, <clears throat> and it, it's like almost desperate sort of thing, sort of reaching toward it, kind of thing. And you're kind of putting that in the context of of, of, a, of, a, of a let's see a, a conventional view of a Japanese woman and thinking, hmm. I and mean, you're wondering if this is an influence somehow by the West. What did you see that made you think Western influence coming from the West? Good. So it's sort of, um, it's, not, it's not showing a Japanese stereotype in any case, or it's, or it's not staying with the kind of, let's say, the conventions of, of Japanese makeup that we would, might be familiar with. But sort of, so you're sort of wondering if this isn't somehow a play on, the, on, a Jap, on a Japanese woman, but in the culture of the West kind of thing, influenced by the West. Okay, good. What more can we find? Gentlemen back there. So, so there, you're finding um, a conflict, let's say, sort of, I'm, I may be embedded in a culture, I may be supposed to be a certain kind of thing, but you know what? My hair is tossed to the winds, my passion is, I'm letting it go. I could, you know what, I'm, we could go on with this, but that was kind of fun, that little comment. So why don't we leave this conversation right here for the moment kind of thing, um, and let's actually move and talk about another picture. But don't want you to forget what we just did. We won't. <laughs> I suspect that's true, and that's one of the things I like about this. So take a look at this for a moment. What's going on here? She's not looking at us. So she, the person in the painting, is not looking at us. OK, what more can we find? Yes.
So if we saw a very active desire in operation kind of thing, sort of in that last image kind of thing. This is sort of more um, sort of s set up for other people's desire, perhaps. Is that what you meant? OK, good. What more can you find? Yes? And then? We don't know what it is. No. So she, so, so there's something that she, she is seeing by not looking at us that we aren't privy to, kind of thing that sort of, so, but she may in fact be operating on desire as well. Okay, good. What more can we find? Yeah. All right, so this, this skin of which we get to see quite a bit, I might add. Um, is so white that it almost seems like as if it's made out of porcelain. It, um, it almost doesn't seem real. Okay, good. What more can you find? Yes. Okay, good. From details of her clothing and perhaps what's in her hair, thinking that this is a woman of some means. Okay, good. What more can you find? Yes. So she's not alone. <laughs> right, so so um, bur burrowing in on a detail, one of the reasons I love doing this is because I've never noticed that before. I've looked at this a lot. But um, uh, sort of noticing that, that the table leg is, in fact, a figure. And it might even be a, a figure of a specific figure, crucifix, or Jesus on the cross. Oh, oh, but anyway, someone. <coughs> All right, good. So there's somehow uh, that this notion is that this sort of this guy is supporting this tabletop kind of thing. Well, I have just, what do you see that makes you think that that's? That the weight, there's weight being born. All right, good. So, sort of, sort of. I asked what what did she see that made her think that this um, figure might be supporting the table, but it's, it's almost metaphorical because this, this woman seems to be leaning on it, and therefore depending on it for support, which uh, indicates to, to some degree her sense of entitlement, kind of thing that might relate to the fact that if, if in fact this outfit does in fact indicate someone who, of wealth, that would be another way of weaseling into that sort of issue. Okay, go ahead, more can we find? Missing something from her life that she can't get because of her status, maybe. 
Okay, on these very white shoulders, you actually might, there might be some weight that um, you wouldn't necessarily expect of someone sort of, you know, of, of, of comfort, but that in fact sort of there's something denied her, and that she sort of, it's not just that she's using this table for as an, uh, kind of an entitled support, but she's tired. <laughs> what did you, what did you, what were you triggering off that sort of gave you the sense that she is somehow world weary? So it's, it, you're not seeing nonchalance in that look. You're sort of seeing something that sort of actually has more meaning and more, and it's kind of an un, unhappiness, sort of something in the, in the way she's staring and, and she's giving us a side of her face. And then, and then leaning, very importantly, sort of on that. Okay, good, what more can we find? Yes? Okay, so, so it's not just that her arm is leaning, but in fact her whole body seems to be tilted backwards. And sort of you, you're, you're agreeing with this sort of sense that there is something in her demeanor that says um, that she's weary, weary, um, and that, it's, that life is not so easy, and that there's something sort of unlike the other image where we could get a sort of sense of freedom and even passion sort of thing, that this is very contained by comparison and maybe not so free. And even pointing out the fact that she seems highly corseted, and that maybe that's a, um, a metaphor in a way for restrictions on her, not just her body, but her person. Very good. More, what more can we find? Yeah. And then, okay. So um, it, maybe it's not clear why, but the fact is it sort of seems to be gripping something. But what it is exactly is not sort of easy to discern in, in, at this moment. Yeah. Yeah. Does anyone know? It's sort of commonly thought of as a fan. Yeah. <coughs> and so she's sort of gripping something. And sort of, I'm wondering if that detail, does that detail add anything? in a sense, to the narrative you tried to be building up about her? Uh, this, I think that the fan might, it might just contribute to that sense that, that the way she's dressed that it's okay, good. Of, Might be part and part of, parcel of this costume. Yes. Costume of OK, good. Any other thoughts? What more can we find? Could we? Yeah. Oh, indeed. Should I go flipping back and forth? Well, I mean,
eroticism and frustration in the second. That I may be reading too much into it, but. Um, well, so, so, but thinking that sort of these are made objects. And, uh, and you happen to know that they're both made by men, and you can even name the people, if you, you know, sort of, um, the artist that did it, sort of, you know, something about sort of their intentions kind of thing. So that in this case, it's sort of there was an, uh, th this artist is working off of earlier Japanese art, traditions of erotic art, and, when, and um, other, other aspects of sort of, you know, Japanese printmaking, and, and, and also just cultural phenomena of early part of the 20th century that sort of might have influenced work at, of an earlier era, but it has the same, some of the same kinds of elements working in it. And that, that also that this is sort of created by a man in, in a diff very different culture kind of thing. But, um, but you can't help thinking about these juxtaposed um, from the standpoint of how um, in, in Western culture, it wasn't unusual for um, people to be depicted, even by this artist, sort of in Asian exotic dress kind of thing. Sort of, so that whole notion of cross-cultural uh, comes up for you, sort of looking at these two things among, a couple, among other things. Um, again, thank you for all of those comments. They're all sort of terrifically interesting and in probing these two things. What if we went to this? And what if we went from there to this? And what if we went from that to this? What do you think would happen? So you're saying a lot of things in a way, sort of, you know, kind of in a way how in just in real life we sort of count on the eyes as communicating a whole lot. And sort of when we look into someone else's eyes kind of thing, sort of, um, you know, we, it's, it's communication is much more direct and much more, we don't trust the people if we can't. And that's sort of what you're finding here when sort of when you can't look into their eyes or something, there's a blockade. It's sort of this. And so you, they leave you out of the equation, kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, it's beautiful because I, I like the passion of it, you know? It's a little bit beautiful. Like, I, I, I like, there's some kind of instrument or some kind of curiosity and, you know, allowing me to enter an experience that is like charged and important. And I can do that. So, with the ones you can look into the eyes of are easier for you, or the other ones that you can't? No, the ones that I can't. Yeah. So I thought you meant. So here. And so 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 the the whole business of not being able to look in their eyes sort of creates a 
for you, uh, di a dynamic with the thing that sort of, that, and, and a kind of a, an unknowable narrative to some degree kind of thing. Uh, but you also sort of said that sort of things that sort of are culturally distant from you um, and that you don't see very often are sort of harder to read. And so, all right, good. What more could you, what do you think would happen if we had sort of gone, gone through a... Good. So, so there may have been a, you know, in my mind, sort of a, a sets of dialogue that sort of, but the fact is that sort of when you talk about something and then you turn your attention to something else, it's very hard not to make a comparison or contrast the, 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 the two experiences and sort of they, the ideas juxtaposed sort of can become more complicated than the ideas of something sort of out of context. All of a sudden, they, they're very different images, but they provide a context for each other and for at least in terms of the conversation that we would have. Okay, so there's that. So what more might come from um, a set of conversations through this sequence? Yes. Okay, I'm going to put this this way. So we have five different cultural constructions of female identity. So that what we could have been doing is exploring not a comprehensive sense of women, but at least five different, very different views of, in, sort of what makes femininity. Again, what else? Well, this is called Guess What I'm Thinking. So <clears throat> I'll put you at your address, but I do, I do want you to think because that's the point. All of it gives us an opportunity to think. And um, so, but one of the things that I would want from something like this would be for you to develop the confidence that you can decode many different visual systems. That you can look at, at this and sort of think, oh, well, like, you know, in a way you're sort of, sort of saying this is, um, foreign to you kind of thing, I would kind of hope that by the time we got to that, that enough things would have come up that we could sort of have some comfort burrowing into another culture which we would, I think, also do as respectfully as we have done with the cultures with which we're more familiar, but, um, but, but try to sort of fathom what this can tell us and why and why. And have something from a distant <coughs> culture made relevant because of the way we examined it and spent time trying to penetrate what it says. It's pretty complicated. Yeah, I think pictures like do that more, I think, in, in art. Um, because we have photos of photography now. And I think that you can get pictures. More Good. So um, one, one of the topics that could come up is the ways in which photography, and this is a photogra photograph, even if it isn't a candid, um, sort of is different as a, as a visual system and sort of, um, and how these things that are representations of something kind of thing are one step away from, let's say, real daily life kind of thing and daily experience kind of thing. And sort of in order to grasp them, sort of it might be nice to have a few contextualizing photographs. 
and some more information, as you were sort of supplying for us, Anne-Marie. But, um, but that said, um, that we can still try to fathom what these do tell us. All right, so, all right, now, the history of this is that this, this device, let's, let's go back for just a minute. Um, let's leave that picture, set of pictures up. <clears throat> what did I do up here as teacher? Pick it apart a little, just a little bit. Oh, I kind of narrated, and how did I do that? Right, good. So I asked questions, and, and then when I heard a response, I, I did what I call paraphrase it. I could have repeated it, and you'd have known I heard it, but I paraphrased it. And what would be the difference in the impact? Good. If I repeated it, it could be you know wandering around the same way you did. Yeah. No, <laughs> but children often do. Right. Um, or, but it also could sort of, uh, wouldn't wouldn't prove that I understood it. It just proved that I heard it. And there's a difference. So I processed it, and sort of, and it's very interesting. But sort of, relatively few of us in the culture feel like very many people listen to us very much of the time. And so just simply having an experience where someone has taken seriously what you've said and uh, seriously enough to sort of put it in their words can be a have a very profound effect in making you feel as if you want to be part of something, <laughs> that, you have, that you are valuable. Um, and there are an awful lot of kids who come into school today who don't feel that way for a lot of reasons. So I linked various pieces of it. So what I was trying to do was sort of show that we're scaffolding on each other. That our ideas are sort of, we're not just having a random conversation, but, that, but it, that it builds. And so it doesn't, it's not just like this comment, that comment, that comment. It, it sort of, they have a, a, there's a purpose for us doing this. We, we probe for more. We might even change our minds, but new details come up. You can sort of see, hmm, I think that, but I could add to that in another, or put that in another way. That, all that sort of stuff is sort of, it models what, it models collaboration the kind of collaboration that's needed to solve most of the world's problems, and none of them are going to be solved unless we know how to do it. So there's an interesting way to teach the collaborative process of listening, valuing other people, agreeing or disagreeing, but being able to do it without rancor, with it contributing to sort of deepening of understandings instead of widening of gaps between, kind of thing. So, so are there any other reflections on what I was doing up here as teacher? Yeah, I kept the playing field even. And I did it because it makes it safe for people to sort of throw in their ideas. If they don't feel, you, I'm going to bite off your head because you're wrong, or congratulate you because you're so great and so fabulous and good kind of thing, which makes the next person think, oh, well, what am I, chop liver, you know. So, so the... So an even playing field is very important if you want everybody to participate. And if, to the extent that people aren't participating, quite often they don't grow as much as if they do. Learning takes activity. It takes action. You can be learning, you can be listening, and be very actively engaged. But if you don't feel like you're part of a conversation, that you're welcomed in, and that your ideas are worth, you know, it's sort of hard to feel that you're going to learn from it in the same way that you can if you do. So it's incredibly important to create a, a, an environment where everybody feels safe, willing to participate, actively engaged. One of the things that's incredible about art as a subject matter is that there are so many different topics. <laughs> I mean, as you say, this is only a few uh, ways that way we could deal with the, the construction of female identity. But, um, <clears throat> but just think about it. Sort of, and we could do the same thing with men and boys, and relationships, and weather, and place. We could set up sort of whole sequences of images where we were penetrating subjects deeply, kind of thing, historical subjects, contemporary things, sort of through, um, through looking at the images that are just sort of, um, that aren't, that, that have plenty of material to get started with. In other words, there's enough to go on. So even that material, the, the image that you sort of view, you don't know very well. There's, you know, you, you know it's a female. You think that there's a baby there. She's sitting. 
there's a, a mood created by the thing. There are various different sort of pieces of what she's wearing that you can pick up on and kind of discuss kind of thing. There's her body posture, all, all sorts of things that, that have, give you a place to start. And then there's stuff to puzzle you, to keep you, to keep you there. Sort of, and that's one of the things that's really great about art. This isn't necessarily true about candid photography. Sort of it doesn't have that sticking power. Because it may just, just tell you too short a story. But with things that, and there's a lot of photographs that, that uh, transcend their moment. In other words, they may have been taken candidly and quickly. I think of several image, photographic images that brought an end to the, to the Viet Vietnam War sort of thing because Americans sort of began to realize what, we were, what was going on and we didn't like it. Um, but in they were photographs that were not taken as art, but they become art because of their power. Um, and they still resonate. Um, maybe not quite as much, but, um, but they did at the time, for def definitely so. But there's this business of what art brings to the table, ambiguity, <laughs> recognizable familiar material, as well as ambiguity, as well as multi-layers, the possibility of symbols, um, things that, that, you know, that, 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 that go beyond um, literal uh, understandings, um, and so on and so forth. So, so part of what this strategy is about is using art to, to start conversations and to use conversations about them to create an environment where conversation can be held about other kinds of things. So again, just to sort of do a little bit of history, sort of when I was at the Museum of Modern Art, with given this concern um, that I help people who, who complained about not being able to understand um, what was going on and too much of the art that was on the walls, um, and sort of wanting some help. With the help we provided was mostly sort of to try to explain why they, what the artists were doing. We tried to do it cleverly. We did, in fact. We did it with warmth and energy and short stories and um, you know, warm personalities and performance technique and so on and so forth. So we could, we could lecture or ask questions or do a combination kind of thing and feel that our audiences were quite with us. But when we actually asked people after a gallery talk that had been tape recorded so we knew what was said, to retrace their steps. They didn't even remember the picture, all the pictures they'd seen, much less what they'd been told. So because it wasn't really sticking. And partly, it was engaging without being enabling. It was sort of like infotainment. It's sort of so, it, it, and that's, you know, um, that business of being able to sort of get people involved but not have them really learn happens all the time. And what's troublesome about it, as far as art is concerned, is that it's too important. But that's also true with most of the subjects that are taught in school. We can't afford to not have people learn. So why, why waste their time? In any case, I was disturbed that people were not having as much meaning, getting as much meaning, and having as much pleasure from stuff at the, at the modern. So when I found out that, that our very engaging lecturers, including myself, sort of didn't actually have any impact on people, I was pretty devastated. <laughs> I found this out by asking a cognitive developmental psychologist named Abigail Hausen, who, who had made it her life's work to try to understand what, how people think when they look at art. And I could go into why she got there, but let's just say she did. Um, and she spent sort of almost 15 years trying to study what happens when a beginning, a person who's never had any experience looking at art, what, what they think, and then what people with more experience, more experience to the point of sort of people who have made art their lives and who are, have huge expertise in it. She, she created a stage theory, and a stage theory is much like thinking about childhood motor development, sort of at some point children just lie there, and at another point they roll over, and at another point they push themselves up, and then they start crawling, and then they pull themselves up on things, and then they toddle, and then they walk, and then they skip and jump and play basketball. So, um, but that goes through a progression of different, of different kinds of things, and sort of so when a child has uh, learned to crawl, they do that. But once they see everybody, I don't know what makes them, but anyway, they sort of look up and see everybody else upright kind of thing. They pull themselves up and start to walk. It's not as if they can't crawl anymore. They just don't. It's not useful to them. They can, there are other ways of getting around. So they've advanced from one stage to another. This happens cognitively. This happens with everything we learn. There are all sorts of things, stages that we go through. Not all of them have been studied. Piaget studied a bunch of them. Um, but that's what Abigail Hausen did. And what she realized is that beginning viewers have a certain kind of frame that they apply when they're looking at works of art. And the people with a little bit more experience have another frame that they use. And they're as different as crawling and walking. Um, they have similarities. There's their links, their behaviors that go from one stage to the next. But 
they're mostly quite different patterns of using their brains as they are looking at things. We were teaching at MoMA strategies that were for the wrong stage of people we were looking at because we were teaching in English. We could, we were teaching, you know, I mean, we were teaching in a language people could understand because we were funny, because we were charming and all that kind of stuff. They could, they could follow what we were saying, but they couldn't incorporate it. They couldn't make it their own. It did not have a strong enough foundation to sort of rest there. We were, it was almost as if sort of we were talking fluent French to people who's, who were really much more comfortable with menu French. And it sort of just would go like this. It, they just didn't mesh. They didn't rest. And <clears throat> so we used Hausen's data to create teaching that was right for stages one and stage two, which was what our viewers at MoMA were. And it was basically the process of trying to teach them how to read. Not read, but read pictures. <laughs> read a variety of things. Have the flexibility to sort of move from one kind of image to another. Um, so in order to do the research, we started working with schools. As soon as we started working with schools, um, who were only a little bit interested in teaching visual literacy, as we were trying to call this, instead of aesthetic development, um, they, they realized that a number of important things happened. That, the, that If you ask the question, what do you see that makes you say that, often enough, people learn to supply evidence as a habit. And so if they do it in their VTS lessons when they're looking at works of art, they'll do it when they're looking at a poem, they'll do it when they're looking at a math problem or in science. And so and they, they told us this and we studied it and found out it was true. There were a number of different sort of thinking behaviors and uh, um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll enumerate them. But um, we used Abigail Hausen's data based on stage development to create a strategies that were appropriate, asking people to do what they already can do, but get better at it, and grow in ways that are always developmentally appropriate. And if all education did that, education would succeed, period. If we were always asking, start making our starting point something that people can and want to do. Motivation is also a key. Um, <clears throat> and then help them get better at what they already can do and put all of your challenges in, in, in a way, in, in, within a distance that's proximal, where they're going next. We could produce learning in a consistent sort of way. When you do it with your peers, one of my favorite peer learning stories is, is with um, my granddaughter, Wyla, who is um, 18 months. I put her on a phone, uh, on, an, on a, um, a, I'm just going to check the time so I, for, so I don't bore you to tears. Okay, so I've only bored you for an hour and 15 minutes. Are you still okay? <laughs> um, but, are you? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, while I was 18 months and she'd never been on a swing before, and I um, <clears throat> put her on it and sort of said, you know, this is, you know, sort of trying to take her swing and put her hands on it. She wouldn't let go of me, and we swang like this, which isn't all that much fun for anybody. <laughs> and so I kept trying to get her to put her hands on it, and she just, you know, it wouldn't have nothing to, to do with the kind of thing. Looked over and saw a boy about her age, maybe a little bit older, with his hands on the string, who was, in fact, strings shaped and who was, in fact, swinging gently back and forth. She let go of me, off we went. That's a truth. <laughs> Kids learn so much more from their peers. It's scary by the time they're in high school. <laughs> but we don't use that. And you do conversation among peers, and they help each other in all sorts of ways. And if you, as teacher, facilitating in the way I was, let's say, using their ideas, but, but helping them up the ante in terms of their language. Um, you can be instructing them in, in language development at the same time as the peer group sort of pushes their ideas. Based on an image that's complicated, and we keep upping the ante with the images, making them harder, the combination is harder images, peer groups, a supported strategy that allows for kids to make their own discoveries, growth, all of them grow. And it's not, they don't backslide. We've studied kids five years out and they haven't backslid. Kids grow over the summer when there's no VTS happening. They're only 10 lessons a year, by the way. It's not a big deal intervention. But taught in this way, the power of it 
is way greater than things that are taught 90 minutes a day. I've had a foundation person look at me and sort of say, how can you tell me that 10 hours a year produces this kind of growth? And I give her all the data and go on and on and sort of I try to argue student-centered, developmentally appropriate, all that kind of stuff, <clears throat> motivation. I don't have anything of it. Sort of, I finally turned to her in desperation. I said, OK, I think I have a, d a better question for you. Why, when someone's taught something 90 minutes a day, every day of the school year, do they not learn that? Do they not learn that? Perhaps there's a difference if you teach differently. <laughs> so anyway, um, th so this is, this is sort of VTS. It's, we know the stages. We use them to create the strategy. We have found that sort of you know, questions, facilitation, and peers can lead to learning, and that the art, if appropriately chosen in the first place, the interest and, in, and sequence to increase the challenge, we can get wonderful things happening. This is the kind of set of images that we use in classrooms. This is beginning in grades three to five. The first lesson is this sequence of pictures, sort of one being the one on the far left, sort of being the most narrative, very simple, everyday stuff, but still a little bit puzzling, sort of, you know, what's, who's in bed? What's the per other person doing? What are those leaves about? What's the kid at the end of the bed thinking, doing, so on and so forth? There's enough difference in time for there to be a kind of an old-fashioned vaporizer, old-fashioned radios and things like that. There are people whose pictures are on the wall. Who are they and what are their relationships to others? So on and so forth. So there's a, um, a partially made outfit on the wall kind of thing and a sewing machine there sort of. So there are pieces of this narrative that, that, are, that are there, but they're re felt relatively e easy to discern visually. And the next one has also sort of a really good story. And one of the, the reasons why I love this picture is that Kids immediately perceive that anybody without shoes on is poor, but when they're happy, it kind of undermines the stereotype of poverty kind of thing. Sort of, and what's kind of fun about this picture is when kids look at it long enough, they realize they're playing guitars, that, but those are electric guitars. Where's the electricity? <laughs> so it sort of has, you know, it's kind of fun. And then the last picture ain't so much fun. And it depends on what disaster, whether forest fires or something you know, um, has occurred through what they read as the reason for this mother and child to be sort of barefoot in the middle of some place kind of thing. But it's much more mysterious, much less information to go on, a much sort of more complicated um, picture to probe than the first one. Does that make sense? So that's just in one lesson roughly an hour-long lesson, sort of 15, 20 minutes on each picture kind of thing. And, and, and the teacher moves on before, as we did, before you're actually finished with the conversation. So you always give the idea that it's sort of an interesting topic is something you can come back to. But a little bit later, we'll have images like this for them to sort of discuss the same way. What's going on here? What did you see that made you say that? What more can you find? And this peer interaction sort of penetrates these kinds of things. Um, the, what's, what's interesting is the picture that's on the, on the left um, will be recognized as Asian, even if it isn't correctly identified as Japanese. There may be some debate on that. Some kids will say Japanese. Some kids will say Chinese. Some kids will say whatever. But they're, they're in the right category. They're looking at, at, and this is for us, enough. They're realizing that this is, is another entity even if they're not quite clear what it is. Does that make sense? So um, with VTS, one of the things that's hard for the teacher to do it is to keep re restrain yourself from correcting. When you know that something is sort of you know, not that, it's not Chinese. But, um, um, but one thing that's kind of interesting is this is done by classroom teachers who may or may not know what the language is. And as a consequence, they're not so tempted to fill in the the accurate answer kind of thing. But we ask them not to do it anyway so that kids have experience in thinking rather than in right answers, in penetrating for meaning rather than for something that's in a way more simple, like this is a Japanese woodblock print. OK, fine. But where do you go from there? It wasn't made to be a Japanese woodblock print. It was made to convey something about a relationship or a set of relationships and a place and a time and so on and so forth. So uh, on to something completely different at another moment. And this, this image is kind of funny to me at this point because 
I was leading a conversation about this with some what I might call overprivileged high school students um, from a private school in Boston. And so I say, what's going on? And some young man raises his hand and he says, well, it's obviously a truffle hunt. <laughs> I don't know if you know, but sort of, um, uh, I think it's true that sort of pigs are used to sort of root through the ground to find truffles that are under, that are buried kind of thing. But they, they, they um, find them, they sniff them out, and then sort of, then people go and grab them and, and collect them kind of thing. But in truth, of course, it's actually an acorn hunt. <laughs> so smart ass wasn't really as smart as he thought he was, but, but still, excuse me. But by the 10th lesson, um, we've got pictures that are actually fairly complicated, sort of, that sort of, you know, the, 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 the one, the first one in the sequence of these pictures, um, the, the, they don't spend a whole lot of time on it, but that expression on that child's face is somewhat akin to some of the other expressions we were sort of probing earlier, in that it's not quite clear how he's feeling, but it's not necessarily all that great. And he may be lonely, he may be bored, whatever it is, and that, meanwhile everybody else is sort of busy. But another reason for selecting this kind of image that might be interested to those of you who are art educators is that sort of the first formal property that starts to show up Nobody's taught this. We've just had what's going on in this picture. What do you see that makes it? Just in these conversations, these kid-driven conversations. But what they have started to do is be interested in the space of the images. Not color or line or shape necessarily, but space. That the property of trying to create a sense of space in images. So we give them something where that dawning interest of theirs is actually something that, that um, finding meaning in the picture asks them to do, to probe levels of the space in these images. So we're not asking them to say, look at the space in this. We're just giving them the chance to do it. And it works. So, so there's that. And sort of each of these pictures has um, a, you know, a reward for dealing with the space in them. Make sense? But they're much more abstract. They're much harder to read. The one at the top, <clears throat> it's sort of not only is it a little bit weird that this girl's sitting, sitting there with a pair of wings on, but, but where is she? Probably in the cab of something that might be a truck kind of thing, and sort of finding the um, license plate on the windscreen is sort of interesting, but then discovering that there's somebody outside, a search for the space, a search of the space in the image, Turns up, oh, look, there's a guy, kind of thing. Um, so, you know, and this one sort of just has the notion of sort of what's going on in the deeper spaces and inside and so on. Not to mention sort of what's going on in the foreground that allows for that shadow to occur that you, uh, by, made by something you can't see. And in fact, sort of here's <laughs> a wall that also becomes part of the dialogue in this picture, um, which is not a typical kind of invitation into a picture. You're sort of, you know, the, the left, you're blocked from entering the picture. Because of what? Yes? And so um, reading the space, is that a, a different stage? No, it's part of um, stage two. But it does represent, because the kids started out in stage one almost uniformly, mm -hmm. it does represent that they're moving into stage two. Um, well, it, um, Hausen has articulated them in sort of great detail kind of thing. I'm just, I decided not to try to do it tonight, but on, we have a website, which of course I should have put it on a slide, but I didn't. But anyway, it's, it's um, www.vue, victorue.org. And under articles, under research and articles, you can find a lot by Hausen that, um, that describe her stages. It, Well, you know, uh, very rarely do people ask. Um, the kids th th basically have no interest in who made it. That's not their concern yet. It will become so. By the time they're in sixth grade and have had four or five years of VTS, it's very much part of what they want to know. But up to this point, not, it's, you know, not, it's not an issue. Um, we have the information available for teachers if they want it kind of thing. And if kids do ask for it, and they sometimes do in their first conversations because 
it's not so much about who did it. They don't really think. In fact, it's over in, only in the course of stage two that they begin to realize that an artist made this. But it's a very generalized notion of artists usually. It's sort of like the work he did. It's not that neat. It's blotchy. It's a very sketchy sense of, 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 a, of an artist rather than like, was this made by Picasso? It's, that's not what they articulate in stage two. But that's a big stage three issue kind of thing. But um, I forget what I was going to say. Anyway, um, so moving along. Are you OK? This, the kind of thinking that we have documented occurring from these discussions, and again, we're talking about four questions, peer groups, upping the ante through the art, changing the art. We're not talking about so much adding strategy. We do add some questions in the later years. We do, but they, the teachers don't often use them kind of thing. So this basically happens as a result of a natural progression of growth occurring really because of these two things, the peer groups and the experience of ever more complicated images that push them. But they learn to make more observations over time, a lot more. The observations become more detailed, and they start to see things in combinations. So it's first, if it's a man, then it's a man wearing a hat, then it's a man standing next to a tree kind of thing. Now, if you just think about that sequence, you'll think about another very important thing that happens as a result of BTS. The increase in the number of observations and the detail drives language. You need adjectives. You need other descriptive language. You need a whole sentence to say, there's a man standing next to a tree. So the whole business of having these conversations, beginning in preschool, drives, the, drives, uh, both drives language. And when the teacher is paraphrasing, both vocabulary and grammar, can, they can be assisted in the developing of these. Not through a direct instruction mean, but through modeling kind of thing. So that people hear, kids hear their own ideas, but express slightly differently and grammatically. And so again, you're not correcting them. You're just showing them how to say it in another way kind of thing. But inferring meaning from these observations. So it's not just that they see stuff, but they start pulling meaning from it. And it often is in a narrative. And that also drives language, trying to tell the story that they see. Um, because of this, this, what we call the second question, what do you see that makes you say that? They, make, they, they will provide the evidence to back up the inferences that they make. What they begin to do because of the group interactions, because of the even playing field, because of the um, scaffolding that's represented by my linking and other teachers linking the answers kind of thing, they begin to think, well, it could be this, but then it could be that. And you know what? It might even be that. And they can hold these different ideas in their minds at the same time. Now, this whole idea of being able to hold multiple viewpoints, all is plausible. You may, in the end, up thinking one is most likely. But the, the idea of being a, that flexible in your thinking, just think of with the American people, just think of what would happen in the world if, if everybody sort of thought, my religion's OK, but so is yours. We might stop sectarian violence. We might stop some of the, you know what I mean? It's just as simple as that. Being able to sort of think that there's more than one way to be that's OK, the fact that we don't think that way is at the root of a huge number of the evils with which we are forced to sort of live in, in our world today. Does that make sense? I'm not trying to be political so much as I'm trying to sort of say that this is, you know, we have human conflict happening because we can't agree with one another easily enough. Not to say you're, I'm right, you're wrong, you're wrong, I'm right. No, but to say you have the right to your opinion, your ideas, as I have to mine kind of thing. Um, so that, and th but the ability to speculate among possibilities is enormously helpful if you're a doctor, sort of look, considering what possible diagnosis to give a patient that's confusing you. Sort of thinking, well, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this, based on the multiple observations I'm making. BTS has got a major, is having a major impact in medical schools at this point. Revising, it's not unusual for someone to say, well, you know, at first I thought, but then I thought. And also to elaborate, to go back in and sort of 
think, rethink. And all of these things have direct implications for writing. So if people are expecting, teachers are expecting kids to learn to write, but they rarely give them a chance to speak, guess which comes first? If you can't say it, you probably can't write it. And if you can say it, you probably can write it. And if you're given the chance to discuss something that's complex, where someone's assisting you with finding good ways to express it and good words to do that with, you're, the, the impact on writing is very powerful. And we have stacks of it to look at, to, to, to argue that. What's sort of interesting is that this combination of the development of thinking skills and of writing is very much in keeping with what's required by Common Core. Through the mere intervention of BTS in elementary schools, beginning ideally in pre-K, but running through sort of fifth at least, or even sixth grade, we have a curriculum that goes that far. We also have curriculums for older. But, <clears throat> but at the end of elementary school, most of the what are called the anchor standards are in place. And um, that's pretty powerful from 10 hours a year of discussions of, of works of art. Now, if it's aided by teachers doing, let me see if I put any other things, oh no. Um, by, by applying the same strategy to poetry, by, tr by, by applying it to word problems in math, by using the same strategy in science and in decoding primary texts in history, in social studies, sort of if this kind of discussion mode is, is carried over into other lessons, all of this becomes anchored much more quickly kind of thing and much more deeply in students and therefore is applied to more of the different kinds of subject areas, disciplines that they're being required to understand in new ways through Common Core. So we have a kind of win-win. But this is the first time BTS, which was designed to create better informed audiences in museums, has a, a role in schools that is, that is very important. And for those of you who are interested in, as art educators in trying to sort of having to justify our existence, we got an argument. I thought I would just leave you with this. A real, a serious thinking problem. And these are two paintings. I'm tell you by, by whom. It's not very BTS for me to do this, but the one on the left is by Pablo Picasso. You probably, many of you recognize it. It's a painting called Demoiselle d'Avignon, which is a euphemism for the horrors of D'Avignon Street. Um, it's painted in a brothel um, by Picasso. And um, it became a very, very influential painting in that it's probably the prototype for what came to be known as Cubism. And <clears throat> the painting on the right is, um, was painted you know, uh, roughly 80 years later by an African-American artist by the name of Robert Colescott who borrowed from, not only from Picasso, but from pop culture, all sorts of caricatures of black people in all sorts of image systems to create this. But probing both of these for meaning is a pretty heady exercise for your mind. And as you do it, you exercise not only your thinking skills, and maybe your language if you're talking with people, but it also pulls in your emotions. And I believe that the reason for the symbiosis between sort of the arts and religion is the fact that sort of that work that's made in the service of trying to help people reach their gods is full of ideas, but it's also full of stuff that plays to their hearts. And it's when we're working both of those at the same time that we feed our spirits. I would argue that art has a place in school for how it teaches thinking and language skills. I would argue that it has a place in our lives because of a lot more than that. What it does for us as it feeds our spirits. Thank you very much. If you're not too exhausted, I'll entertain questions. Uh,
<laughs> looking at them. Uh, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's fantastic. And actually, I'm sort of a very important uh, high school teacher in, in um, Boston, sort of um, BTS is seen from Hamilton with, with their class. And then BTS, two, two separate renditions of that, one by Mel Gibson, same theme, one by Kenneth Branagh. And sort of, so they sort of took, you know, they figured out what they thought it meant from the script. And then they figured out sort of, you know, how that, and how, what, and they, by the way, Mel Gibson lost. <laughs> Which pleased me no end. Thank you so much for that presentation. It's really wonderful being able to hear you speak here as opposed to reading articles online. <laughs> um, but I have a question. It's um, sort of long winded, so bear with me. I, full disclosure, I'm doing my graduate work here in art history, and I teach in, in the classroom here at History of Western Art. I'm a teaching assistant in many of these classes. And it concerns. Could you speak to the Yeah. It concerns teaching in the you know, digital age. What I thought was really interesting in this exercise was that when you posed um, the Sargent painting, or when you, when you were comparing the Sargent painting with the Japanese painting, no one here identified, I think until Enro spoke, them as paintings. Everyone was calling them images. And so my question with regard to visual literacy, I, I mean, we see this in the classrooms here all the time, is that by the time students get to the university level, they're unable to talk about um, the materiality of these objects, which is a very sort of interesting conundrum because on the one hand, it's very important to be able to dissect the narrative and be able to use symbols in order to reconstruct these ideas. But I'm just curious if there's anything we can do or in your opinion, now as we're moving forward, where so much exposure for kids and people doesn't come from actually encountering the objects in situ or in the museum, but it comes from looking at reconstructions online. And some of these reconstructions aren't even um, you know, supportive of the original work. And it's just I, you know, something I think about a lot. No, it's sort of an important thing. I think that sort of, we can't put down the importance of reproduction in, in our culture. Sort of it's, you know, it's the way we learn about it, almost everything kind of thing. And thank goodness we have access to that. But then also what's sort of interesting is in, particularly in an academic institution where you've got a wonderful museum like the Schnitzer, you've got the chance to sort of do combine both. You can just sort of use, do what you can do in sequencing things and juxtaposing things and thing, ha having things that are not available to you sort of by way of reproduction and you can grapple with them in terms of meaning. But in terms of the materiality kind of things, you can then build in visits to the museum to sort of look at the, con to contrast that experience with this and sort of, so what we do is our lesson, our ideal plan in schools is for the 10th visit, 10th lesson to be in a museum. The last set of discussions take place in a museum kind of thing. So the kids get the opportunity to sort of experience the material object and realize the difference and they love it. You know, in some places they do do it multiple, make multiple visits, that's not often possible anymore, but is that the kind of thing you were talking about? Um, when we're talking, you know, when we're talking about paintings in class and they're looking at that visual image, um, they're unable to translate the words and the vocabulary, the formal vocabulary that they might use in the museum setting into the classroom setting. Well, so you can help that to some degree yeah. by paraphrasing yeah. open-ended discussions, sort of throwing in the, the, the language that, that you, that they need ultimately. Um, but at the same time, you should do, so what Abigail Hausen has noticed about um, aesthetic growth is that sort of, if you were to go to door to door or grocery store and just interview people kind of thing, you'd find that the vast majority of people are in stage one. That means pretty basic viewing habits. And sort of, um, it, it really is sort of, it's a very, very narrow pattern of, of behaviors. It's making relatively few, very simple observations pulling inferences from that are maybe one or two instead of multiple kind of thing. It's sort of, it's a very quick take and it's random, not, there's no system to it at all. There's no thought about things being made by someone. There's no, there's no category of art applied to them for the most part kind of thing. That happens over the course of stage two kind of thing. The majority of museum visitors are in stage two, but they're in a very early stage two. The only thing that Abigail Hausen has ever been able to find that changed people's stage 
was what she calls eyes on canvas. It's time not just spent looking, but looking and thinking. And so what you need to do with your students at the beginning of the time, because there's been a paucity of this kind of experience in their lives before they get to the university, is give them a very substantial opportunity to sort of look and look seriously with your help, with something like BTS, sort of, so that they get the business of becoming visually, you know, that they hone their viewing skills, which they had when they were three. Kids can observe the pants off us. There's no question. Um, but, but they have lost because of the dependence on text, because of you know, the idea-based teaching rather than image-based teaching kind of thing. Sort of, so you just need to give them time and patience sort of, so that they get that eye on canvas moment guided by you. But uh, there's, no, you know, th there's nothing to do but address it. You know, sort of, I would say, I mean, I'm not sure that I'm still answering your question, but. I do have colleagues who have been using BTS in the context of teaching art history. And if you'd like to be put in touch with them. Well, we, use it, we use it actively. My, I guess my question is a little bit more vague in the sense that I'm just foreseeing this problem of teaching about art history in the digital age when people aren't going to be able to be in front of these objects and what do we do? And we have to learn a lot about how to deal with this digital age we're in. But one of the wonderful things about it is it sort of makes an awful lot of really great pictures available to us in pretty good reproduction. And using that in the most creative way possible sort of is smart. Yeah? The experience reminds me a little uh, about memes and how fast they travel. I think so, and uh, you know what the direction of it uh, is is the sharing, and I kind of wish a little bit more of it was sort of face to face and real community instead of the kind of I think sort of fakey community. That There's some people here who've actually been trained in this technique, so maybe they could even assist you. Awesome. <laughs> All right, good. So, Kush Cafe tomorrow night? Six to nine. Six to nine. Thank you for that. So, um, I, you know, they, the museum's been kind enough to sort of put a bunch of books out there, sort of. So, if anybody's interested in any of the things I've written for children and otherwise, sort of, it's out there, and I'll be happy to sign them for you, but I think we should probably let you go home. <laughs> Thank you so very much for being here.